Great. Well, good morning. Um, absolute privilege to be here, but it's great to see Pastor Bill up and about and active again. Like um, as I've travelled around the world over this last few months, there are people all over the place praying. And um, I know in that first couple of weeks when we first got the message, I was in PNG at that time, and uh, there was a lot of prayer going there. And a couple of the services, we spent a lot of time just praying in tongues and praying for for you and Kathy and for that. So uh, lots and lots of prayers are happening. So it's just, yeah, fantastic to, to be here and see you up, Pastor Bill, and around the place. So that's awesome. Well, I'm going to share this morning on made for such a time. I am willing and ready. Made for such a time. And Pastor Bill just made a mention this morning about um, getting involved in the life of the church here and serving. And it just reminded me of a time where I, when I was here at the church, I was just a young guy in the church, and um, I'd been sacked from the PA desk from, by Kathy Vasilakis. Um, I got to tap on the shoulder and say, you're out of here, mid-service, go, don't come back. Um, that's probably something to do with the fact that I'm tone deaf, and um, it was terrible. Um, so I got the sack as a 13-year-old from the PA desk. So at another point in time, I was here at church and just wandering around early trying to find something to do, and um, just... On this Sunday, the worship's fantastic. It's just started and um, Pastor Bill comes out and he sees me. He says, Jeremy, come here. And I think, this is my time. This is my moment. He's finally recognised me. I'm willing, I'm ready, Pastor Bill. What do you want me to do? And he says, oh, one of our visitors has just thrown up in the toilets. Can you go clean it up? <laughs> that was my moment. For such a time as this, I was ready and willing. Um, those who know me, I have a very weak stomach to the smell of vomit. So as I cleaned up the mess, I was contributing more to the mess. Um, as soon as our kids vomited, it was when we had babies. Sandra just said, leave it to me. You're just going to make more of a mess. Stay away. Um, so that was my moment. There it was. So today is about made for such a time, being willing and ready. And I want to encourage you this morning. Uh, to get involved. We're going to have a look at a story. It's the story of Esther. I know many of you read this story uh, a couple of months ago in your Bible reading. Um, so we're going to look at the story of Esther. Um, but as we look at this story, please, I want to make sure um, that you get this part of the story and this concept as I preach through and share through, because I want you to get that it's actually a story of God and God at work in Esther's life that he positioned her. He was the one. He was the way maker. He was the one who made a way for her at a moment in time when she made it, had to make a choice to get involved. Um, so please don't miss that in all that I'm sharing, that it is, it's the story of God and God's involvement in Esther's life, but that's a story of, for me and for you about how God has positioned us and purposed us for moments in time and for such a time as this to, to make an impact and to do something for him. Just as I was sitting down the front, this is, wasn't, I didn't share this in the earlier service, but just felt really strongly this morning that there is some of you that the story of Esther is the story of a girl who was a queen, yes, um, but she came from, had an opportunity to see her own people, her own people were under threat there was a group of people that were going to be disadvantaged and were going to be, be murdered um, and mistreated um, by power. And she was given an opportunity to speak to power because she was willing to step up. And I'm just really feeling that there is some of you here today and for this church that you're going to see disadvantage and people who are in need and God is going to give you opportunities to speak to power to bring change for their life. Um, so yeah, that's just, I just felt that as we were, we were there together, um, just as we were worshipping. So let's look at Esther. Um, we're going to look at Esther 4, verse 12 to 14. It's on the screen. Um, but let me give you some backstory or just set the scene for you. Esther's an orphan. So at a young age, she lost her, uh, lost her mum and dad. Uh, she went into care. Her cousin took care of her. Maybe she's in foster care. Maybe we'd call it like that. Or she's been adopted by her cousin who takes care of her. Not an ideal start to life. She's living in the nation of Persia at the time. Persia at this time ran from India all the way through to Ethiopia. It is a massive nation. 
Um, there is a vast majority of people in the Persian nation at that time who um, had long-term hatred uh, towards the Jews. Haman, the man who is second in charge to, um, to the king, who is now her husband, hates the Jews. Esther has hidden her identity as a Jew because, uh, to, yeah, she's hidden her identity, but she knows the hatred of the people and a vast majority of that population towards her and her people. Not necessarily the ideal uh, environment to grow up in, is it? Um, but this is where God had positioned her. God positioned her there because of the great looks that he gave her. She's beautiful. She's won a beauty contest. Out of all the nation of Persia, they reckon about 50 million people, she is selected as the most beautiful. Um, probably half of those are ladies, um, but out of 400, they were selected, and she was out of that, that 400, she was picked as the one that the king desired to make his new queen. She's got the opportunity to be queen because um, the previous queen refused to obey the king. He, the king is having a drunken party. He's got all his soldiers in. They're having a great celebration. They've been drinking alcohol and partying for weeks or a week or so. Uh, and at the end of that time, he says, bring my wife in and she can, I can show her off to all my drunk friends. You know, that's not... She says, no way, mate. She says, no chance. And he has the opportunity. He could have had her killed, but instead he has her excommunicated, cuts her off as his queen. So this is where she comes into. She fits in. She wins this competition. Now she's the queen. Not a secure position. We think of the queen and we think of power. We think of comfort. We think of prestige. But for Queen Esther, it's a position of insecurity because if she makes one slip up, does one thing wrong that doesn't please the king, she's gone. God had positioned her at that time. For such a time as this, he had positioned her there. Just before this verse in chapter, chapter 4, um, Haman has convinced the king to set it up so that by law that the Jews in about a year's time, they would be all, there would be a mass genocide, that they would, the people of Persia would have the right to kill the Jews and take their possessions. And... Mordecai, her cousin, comes to her and says, Esther, you've got to do something. You've got to do something. And Esther's first response is, well, hang on a minute. I can't. She says, well, basically, I'm paraphrasing, but she basically says, well, you know, if I go to the, I can only people who are called to go to the king can go to the king. This is not a normal marriage. I don't get to just go and front up to my, my husband and talk to him. I don't have that opportunity to speak to him. I only get to go into his presence when he calls me to come. He hasn't called me for the last 30 days. So she says, and if I do go and he's not happy with me, he'll have me put to death. So then... That message comes back to Mordecai, and now we're, this is where we pick up the story. Let's read it together. You can see it up there on the screen. I'll, I'll read it to you. When Esther's words rep were reported to Mordecai, he sent answer back, uh, he, back this answer. Do not think that because you are the king, in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will rise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but for that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Who knows? He's saying, come on, you've got to stand up. You've got to do something. Let's break this down. The first part, we'll learn, for if you, it'll come up there on the screen. If you, doing something that only you can do, Esther, he's saying to his cousin, He's saying to this girl that he's been like a father figure to, if you remain silent, but if you speak, that you're in a position that, of, that nobody else has. Are you willing to speak? Are you willing to play your part? Are you willing to get involved? That should be have a part to play, not have a part to plan. Um, 
but God will do his part, but will you get involved? If you get involved, will you get involved? You know, in, with God's plans and God's purposes, you know, you and I have a choice. If you'll get involved, will you get involved? And the church at the moment is having um, a drive or promoting and trying to get more and more people involved in ministry and service in the church. So the question is, if you, will you get involved? Will you take this opportunity to serve in the life of the church? And maybe you'll say, well, it's not an ideal circumstance, not an ideal time. But Mordecai is saying to Esther, if you will, if you. God will do his part, but I need you to do your part. I want you to do your part. You know, Jesus said, I will build my church. Jesus is going to build his church. He is building his church. He's at work at building his church. Whether we get involved or not get involved, it's guaranteed Jesus will continue to build his church. And we have the wonderful privilege of making the choice of saying, I'm going to get involved. I'm going to participate. I'm going to join in. I'm going to play my part in seeing Jesus build his church. So we have a choice. Mordecai says, well, if you don't do it, relief and salvation will come to the Jews by some other, some other way. He says, Esther, he is absolutely convinced at the promise of God that was given hundreds of years ago that God, if you don't do it through this girl, if you don't do it through Esther, you will do it some other way. But Esther, you've got a chance to get involved. Esther, God wants to use you. <clears throat> we don't face that level of choice. Esther's faced with a choice of genocide, ethnic cleansing. Will she try and do something to hold this back? Most of us are not faced with that level of decision um, that we can you know, save a nation and save hundreds of lives. But the truth is, Without Christ, people are going to a Christless eternity. That is spiritual death. And you and I have the wonderful privilege of being able to get involved and actually lead people to Christ, to see the light of Jesus Christ come into their life. And I'm not trying to put the heavy on, but it's that we do have a choice. Will you? If you choose to get involved, uh, let's choose to do that. Let's continue to get involved. <laughs> Esther really had a choice. Would she listen to her king? The king who gave her a level of comfort, a level of prestige, a level of honor, a level of maids and servants and um, all those sorts of things. Would she obey that king or would she obey a bigger king? Would she obey King Jesus? Would she listen to King Jesus and see what God was doing and respond to his voice and prompting to her heart? She had a choice. We all have a choice. But I love Mordecai's statement that he's absolutely convinced, absolutely convinced on the promise of God, that God would bring salvation to these people, that their enemy would not get the victory, that he would make a way. And he uses the word here, um, as we go on, it says, who knows but that you. In the New Living Translation, it says, perhaps, or it could be. Or well, the message says, who knows, maybe you were made queen for such a time as this. I love the uncertainty of that. There's no guarantee. There's not, this is what God has re revealed to me and now you're going to, outwork God's plan. It's not a vision that she's had from heaven. Like Moses got a burning bush that told him exactly what to do. Abraham got a clear voice from God. Go and leave your people and this and this and this. Mary had an angel come and speak to her about how she was going to be pregnant and how she was going to uh, give birth to the, the saviour of the world. Esther gets none of that. She just gets a perhaps and a maybe. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> A perhaps and a maybe, you could risk your life and God might do something. God might just turn up. I know many people at different times get that certain word, that clear revelation. God visits them and speaks to them and they're absolutely certain of what God will do. But my feel is that most of life is lived in that place of uncertainty. Most of life is lived in that place of perhaps God will. When Jonathan 
came to his armor bearer. The enemy's right there and Jonathan's sitting with his father under a pomegranate tree, going nowhere, doing nothing. The enemy's there. Jonathan goes to his armor bearer and says, come, let's go over and pick a fight with the enemy. And he says, perhaps God will get us the victory. God can save by many or by few. Nothing's impossible to God. I don't have a guarantee. He says to his armor bearer, I don't have a guarantee that God's gonna do it, but let's go and see what God can do. Let's go and see if God turns up. Life is lived in that place. So much of life is lived in that place of uncertainty. Who knows what God is going to do? Who knows when God's going to turn up? But we're given an opportunity to say, well, I'm going to take a step. I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to step out in faith. I'm going to move forward on the perhaps. And we have the Word of God, the Scriptures that have so many promises It's full of promises that cover every possible scenario in life. And that we could take them at face value and say, well, God, you said it there. You said it to there. You said it before. You did it for those people. I'm going to see if you're going to do it for me. I'm going to see you make a way for me. I'm going to step out. And if I die, I die. If I live, I live. That's Esther's response to it. But I'm going to do something. I'm not going to sit here and just let life pass me by. A number of weeks ago, um, just having a bit of time where I was a bit stressed and a few pressures going on and um, I was just thinking about all the possible scenarios of how it could outwork um, and I had this sweet old lady say to me, um, why don't you just stop thinking about that and just pretend and take the promise of God at face value that God works all things for the good of those who love him and it changed my perspective because I was looking at all the troubles and all the things And that dear old lady who's my mum, just switched my perspective. Okay, well, God, what are you doing here? What can you do? What can you bring out of this, God? I can't get caught up in, I can look at all of it, and all of it's reality. It's not working out exactly as I thought. I don't see Esther, like, I don't see Esther's parents. I know they were dead, but don't think when she was born, thinking our dream for her is to be the queen of Persia, married to this man who is a pagan, who's not even follows our religion, is far from us, has many white or many ladies that he um, has relationship with. It's not, it wouldn't have been their ideal dream for her. Um, but somehow in the midst of that, and somehow in the messiness of all of that, God made a way for her. You know, in the messiness of our own lives, God makes away for us. So perhaps, maybe, so getting involved at this time for you will mean allowing God and seeing that God is at work. And you look at the story of Esther all the way through. God is actually not mentioned by name in the book of Esther. Did you realize that? Not once is he actually mentioned by name, but you see him at work the whole way through. He's actually the hero of the book of Esther. And he's at work the whole way through. Time and time again, you say, God, you did that. God, you're at work there. God, you're at this. But they don't name him. And he's not, there's no miracles, specific miracles or healings or anything like that. But we see how God was at work in rescuing his people through a girl named Esther. God's at work in your life. God's at work. Whether you feel it or not, whether you're in a dark time or a happy time, struggles, God is at work work. Let's continue on. That verse comes on and says, came to your royal position where God has positioned you. You are not where you are by accident. Hallelujah. That is good to know. You're not where you are by accident. God has positioned you. God had positioned Esther at that place for that time. God has positioned you for where you are now for this time and you're not there by accident. You may feel like you got yourself there. Esther could feel, oh, I got here because I am so beautiful. I won the contest. I won the king's heart. I got to this place because of my talent, my sweet words, and I knew how to look at the king beautifully and flatter my eyes and get his heart and do all those sorts of things. But no, God had positioned her there for this moment, this time. Wherever you are at this time, this week, today, God has positioned you. I believe God has positioned you in this church. You're not here in this church by accident. You made a choice to hop in the car and come. I know that. 
but I know that you're not here and the part of the life of this church by accident. God has positioned you here for a purpose. We've got to believe that because the alternative is miserable. To believe that it's just all by chance and it was all my decisions that got me here or got me to this place or that place, I'm thinking, no, God, you're at work. So as Pastor Bill mentioned, I'm going to Nepal in a couple of weeks' time just for three days. Um, But we had a group of Nepalese join our church in Cairns who have a Nepalese fellowship and they connected me with somebody who I've met a couple of times and now I'm going to Nepal. And I don't have any guarantee that CRC is going to start in Nepal, but I'm believing that it is. And perhaps this is God's connection. So I'm going to go and see. Um, Go over there and run a leadership seminar for two days and see what the Lord does. But where has God positioned you? You're not, whatever you're doing, you're not there by accident. He's positioned you there for a purpose. In the amplified version of this scripture, it says, who knows whether you have obtained royalty for such a time as this and for this very purpose purpose for this time for this purpose to save and rescue God's people what you're doing matters where God has positioned you matters at this time and maybe you have dreams of being something significant something great and doing something out there in the future but this time is significant what you're doing now matters I was listening to something I can't remember on Facebook or on the internet as I was preparing and one of the preachers and some of the stuff I was reading said, being convinced that what you, convincing yourself that what you do now matters. What you're doing now is significant. Um, so mums, those of you who are mums with little kids, what you're doing is significant. Changing that nappy is significant. It matters. Fathers, when you come home, from a busy day at work and you spend time kicking the ball around and spending time with your son or your daughter. It matters. It is significant. It is important. And maybe it's just for that at this time is your key purpose, the key thing that the Lord would have you do. But don't minimize what you are doing because what you do matters. Okay, smile at the person next to you. Tell them what you do matters. What you're doing matters. What you're doing is significant. Because we can look at everybody else and say, well, what they do is important, but what I do doesn't really matter. I'm just, I'm just this. I'm just doing that. But as a businessman, what you do matters. Ah, as a husband or a wife, what, you do, what you're doing is matters. As a school teacher or a nurse, as a doctor, What you do matters. As a grandmother or a grandfather, what you do with your grandkids matters and is significant. Who knows, those hours, that time you sow into their life, what impact that is having for their future. We need to know that the things that we do matter. And God has put us here at this time for a purpose, for a reason. It's not an accident. Hallelujah. So Esther is faced with a choice. Would Esther stand up? Would she stand up? Would she own her identity? She's a Jew. Is she going to own her identity or is she going to turn her back on her identity? Would she stand up knowing and speak to the king, knowing that it could cost her her life? Knowing that there will be consequences for her action? So she goes on and tells, sends a message back to Mordecai. Tell all the Jews, I'll get all my people, you get all your people, we're going to fast for three days. Doesn't mention prayer. She says, go, just tell them to fast. And on the third day, on the third day, I will go and approach the king. And if I perish, I perish. Hallelujah, what a promise. What a commitment. She says, I'm laying it all on the line. I'm going to put it all on the line for somebody. This is my time. This is my moment. I've got to do something. So she puts everything on the line at this time. So she approaches the king. She says, I I don't know whether it was the three days to get herself looking good, get the clothes right, do everything, but she got herself ready. She approaches the king 
he has her come, he, she gets to speak, then she says, oh, can I do a meal for you tomorrow night? He says, yeah, that'd be great. Then the next night, that night, they have the meal. And I don't know whether she, it was always her plan to have a second meal or whether she just felt that now's not the right time to speak, to put my request to the king about him wanting to kill the Jews. Or he just, she read the signs. She realized this is not the time to speak. So she says, I want to put on a dinner tomorrow night. And during the night, the king has, her husband, the king has a, has a vision, has a dream to read the scrolls. So he gets up, reads the scrolls, finds out about Mordecai that he hadn't given a promise to, does something for him and turns the whole situation around where he then uses Esther to speak about that night at the dinner. He, he, she can speak to him about the Jews and about what is going on. It's absolutely unbelievable how God intervened. How God spoke to a pagan, spoke to somebody who didn't even, is far from God. Living a life far from anything that you would call Christian or godly. But God still spoke to him, orchestrated things, made a way for Esther not to lose her life and to save his people. For some of you today, you're looking for God. You're looking to God and saying, God, I need you to make a way for me in personal areas of your life. Say, Lord, I need a way maker. I need you to make a way through. I need you to do something for me because I'm there's trouble here and I need a breakthrough. And we'll pray for that at the end of the service. We'll give time for ministry into that. But for Esther, it was laying her life on the line at this time for her, for her people. Esther in this story is, is a picture of Jesus. Jesus who, for you and I, has at the right time, just at the right time, laid everything on the line, put his life on the line for you and for me. Let's have a look at Romans 5, verse 6 to 8. You see, just at the right time, when you were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for the righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ is pictured here in Esther, that she was willing to give up her life for the people. Jesus Christ himself has given up his life for you and I. He died on that cross at just at the right time. You know, Jesus never turns up, didn't turn up early and he didn't turn up late. He turned up right on time. How often are we thinking, God, you're slow in coming. God, <laughs> could you just turn up now? Turn up a bit earlier, please, God. I think I've had enough, Lord. This is, but Jesus, just at the right time, he turned up. He did it then for the cross. He also now, he turns up just at the right time. But God is going to use you to turn up just at the right time in other people's lives. That you're going to, this week, just at the right time, speak the right word to a neighbour. Just at the right time, go and visit somebody. Just at the right time, ring a family member and speak positivity and speak something into their situation in the circumstance. Because Jesus is never late. And because we're his people, he gives us insight, gives us direction, guides us so that we can turn up just at the right time for others as well. But the question is, will we get involved? Will we realise that, God, you've given me a purpose? Opening our eyes and saying, Lord, I'm, I'm ready. But Jesus demonstrated his love for us by giving up himself. And, you know, he asks us to follow his example and his model to give up something of ourself for, for others who are facing a Christless eternity, living in darkness, spiritual darkness, to the things of God and to the things of Christ. And he asks us, what are you willing to give up so that somebody else could join in? What are you willing to give up so that they can experience what you have experienced? He's asking us as a church, Ah, what are we, what are, what are we going to do? Just at this time, I placed you, I positioned you in the western suburbs of Adelaide for this time, for your community. But not just for the western suburbs, for the city of Adelaide, for the state of South Australia, for the nation and for the nations. That at this time, this church is strategically positioned 
to take the gospel, to share the message, to minister grace, to minister kindness, to touch our community. And Jesus laid it all on the line. So it will take sacrifice. It will take commitment. Esther had to stand up and face it. Well, I'm putting it all on the line for you, Jesus. Jesus put it all on the line for us. And then he asked us to follow in his footsteps. So he's positioned you for something. His timing is amazing. His timing shows his great love for you and I. How many times has God turned up just at the right time for you and me? Poured out his love, demonstrated his love for us to rescue us, to save us, to open up heaven's door. Times of darkness and sorrow that his light comes in. Wow. Awesome. Well, Jesus is our way maker. And that is what I want you to hear through this, ser this sermon. Is that, yeah, we have a choice. We have an opportunity to get involved. He does ask us to, to lay it on, down on the line. But he has made a way for you and for me. And if you're here today and you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, he laid down his life to make it a way, to make it possible for us to be included into his family, to rescue us from destruction, from death, from separation from him, and to include us into his family. That is awesome news. So if you have not made that choice to say, Jesus, I see that you have made that way, I'd love for you to respond today. So during the serve, at the end of the service, if you just want to come down the front here and say, I, I've never invited Jesus into my life, I've never followed that path, but I'm ready to take a step in that direction. Maybe you're not even ready to make a full commitment to Christ. You, don't, you may not even know what that means, but you're saying, yeah, I'm ready to move forward. I want to understand more about it. I'd love for you to come and just uh, stand down the front in a minute or two with, with others that come. Or if that's too scary for you, talk to a person that brought you. Talk to somebody, tell them, I want to find out more. What does it mean about be, having a friendship with Jesus Christ and being part of his family? Because you're not here by accident. You're here for a purpose. God brought you into this church for a reason and he's on your case. He's chasing you. And he wants to be involved with you. He wants to have fellowship and with you. Jesus is the way maker. We have a choice. Will we get involved? He has positioned us strategically, purposefully for this time. And I believe that with all my heart. And I believe that for you as well, that you're not at work by accident. You're not in that office in the city by accident. You're not driving to another suburb, into a school, to teach children that are not your own by accident. It's all strategically purposed by God. God has positioned you in this church for a purpose. And at the end of the service, you're going to fill out one of those forms and put it in and say, yeah, I want to... Make, I want to, God, make a way for me to get involved in ministering to somebody, touching somebody's life, doing something here in the life of this church. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask the musicians to come. As they come, let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for the story of Esther, which is a story of you being the hero. You taking the mess that Esther found herself in, the difficulties and struggles that she went through, but you filled her with courage, you filled her, put a person around her to speak to her, and she stood up and said, yep, I'm going to step out for you, I'm going to lay it all on the line, and Jesus, you made a way. God, you are the God who makes a way, that you position us for purpose. And Father, I just pray that you would help us all understand that, take hold of that, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to sing together. I ask you to stand to your feet. We've got a few minutes to pray. And if you're looking to God to be your way maker, because things are dark or things are troubled, or you, you, you're saying, God, I want to move forward. I want to be a bit of Esther. I want to make the most of this moment, this time. Love you just to come and stand down the front and say, Jesus, I'm going to move down the front as a step of faith. Esther had to move towards a king and risk her life. All you've got to do is just come down here and say, Jesus, I want you to, to move with me. I want you to make a way for me. And maybe there's some situations, many of you, I'm sure, facing situations and circumstances where you need the supernatural intervention of God. 
And I believe in our Waymaker, our Jesus, that is at work. Some of you are just facing some discouragement, say, man, things are tough at the moment. Need a touch from Jesus so I can just keep plodding away in the routine and seeing that there's meaning and purpose in what Jesus has for me. Also, we have a God who heals. So if you're sick, love to lay hands on you, pray for you and believe for the healing power of Jesus Christ to lift that sickness, to lift that oppression, to lift that heaviness from you in the name of Jesus. So we're going to sing this song together. Thank you, Nathan. So as we sing, just please quickly move out of your seats and we've got a prayer team ready to pray for you.